Good afternoon. Jason, I want to ask you for some help. Would you put the second stanza of Heaven Came Down back up on the screen for me? I believe it was the second. The one that we had trouble finding there for a minute. All right, try, try another one. Maybe it was one of the others. No, the heaven came down. The, okay, just stop right there because I want to go through these real quick. Let's, uh, let's ask the Lord one more time to be with us. I know he's heard us already because he's here. Father in heaven. We come to you today in the precious and the mighty name of your Son, Adonai, Yahushua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, your word cannot fail. Help us today, Father, to eat of the leaves of the tree of life, to eat the bread of life, to drink the water of life. Help us to hear your voice, Father. You have said that your word shall not return unto you void. Father, I thank you for that promise. And as we speak your word today, Father, we claim that promise. Your word will work in us, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. We thank you, Father. And we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. I want you to look. Look at these words. A lot of times we read you know, songs or we read a hymn and we think that was somebody's feelings. But we don't realize that many of those old hymns are scripture. I want you to look at these words and then I want you to go home and pray and say, Lord, show these to me in the scripture. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you were made whole 2,000 years ago? Are you still looking for the, the second coming of Christ to fix that? I know. I know what that's like. But do you want to know something? I'm not going to let go. I'm going to be like that widow who banged on that king's door every single day. And I, I'm going to keep knocking. Because Jesus said, if you knock, I will open. If you ask, I will answer. If you seek, you shall find. Was he lying or was he telling the truth? I'm asking you. Are you sure he was telling the truth? Do you know, I remember one time my son and I were going to a meeting in North Carolina. And he was younger. I don't remember exactly how old. Maybe nine, ten years old. And... Um, I told him I needed to pull off the road because I wanted to, to check my blood sugar and I had to take some insulin. And he looked at me out of the mouth of babes and he said, Daddy, do you remember that verse that you read the other day about by his stripes we were healed? Connor said, why don't you just throw the insulin away and believe God's word? Do you know what that did to me? It, it showed me that I had no faith. It's not that God's word has failed. It's not that he really won't move a mountain if I tell the mountain to be moved. It's my faith that's lacking. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. Amen. Psalms 107 verse 20. He sent his word and healed us and delivered us from his from our destructions. Psalms 103, He forgave all my iniquities and He healed all my diseases. Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 6, By His stripes you were healed. And people, I've had people tell me this, and they love the Lord, but they tell me without knowing what they're saying, that's talking about spiritual healing. Well, do you know that in Matthew chapter 8, 
Peter quotes Isaiah 53 when Jesus healed Peter's wife's mother from the fever. He said, this is a fulfillment of Isaiah 53. Do you know that in Peter, it's either first or second Peter, you have to forgive me, I don't remember the which one. He says the same thing, past tense. When at the cross, my sins were washed away. Are we still waiting for them to be gone? Is he going to bleed again? If you fall tomorrow, does he come down from heaven again and die all over again? Then what makes what he did at the cross yours and mine? Ellen White says you have to appropriate it as your own. It's already been done. My night was turned to day. Isaiah, our brother, was reading that this morning. The whole world will be covered with darkness. But light has come. What is light? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I had left my wife and my children and was living in adultery, my wife could look at the circumstances and it was blackness and darkness and hopelessness and impossibility. But God's word says... With God, all things are possible. How many things? Do you believe that? Can He heal your disease? Can He restore your marriage? Can He heal your broken heart? Okay, then find the promise where He said He's done it and take hold of it. Do like that woman did and reach out and take hold of the borders of His garment and refuse to let go. Do what Jacob did. Do what Jacob did when he was wrestling with Christ. Do you know he wrestled? And do you know I've had people tell me, well, sometimes it's for God's glory for you to be sick. Okay, it's for God's glory, according to his word, to heal me. If I'm sick, then I want him to teach me what it is he wants me to learn so I can go on to the next challenge. He doesn't get glory or enjoy seeing us suffer. Do you know that Jesus said that? Jesus said, if my son comes to me and says, Daddy, would you give me a piece of bread? Will you offer him a rock? Daddy, give me a fish to eat. Will you give him a scorpion or a serpent? How much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those that ask? What kind of good things? Do you know that in Psalms 34, verse 7 and 8, it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is that man and that woman that trusteth in Him. You've got to take hold of Christ like Jacob did. I want to tell you something I didn't realize until this year. Do you know that when, um, when Jacob was wrestling with Christ, Christ told him to leave him alone? Do you know that Christ did the same thing with Paul. I'm going to be like Paul. I'm going to keep asking him and I'm going to claim it. I'm going to say, you swore an oath to me. I will not let you go except you bless me. Your word. This is your word. You promised me. Paul did the same thing. And you know what God did? God told Paul on the third time, This wasn't the third time Paul had asked. This was the third time that God had said no. God said, don't ask me again. This is for my glory. Do you know what that sickness was? It was his eyesight. When Christ had blinded him, you read his letters and Paul says, if it had been possible, you would have given me your eyes. Paul was the greatest apostle as far as a writer in the world. What do you do if you're a writer and you can't see? What do you do if your gift is to write and you can't see? If I remember correctly, there's only one of the New Testament books that he wrote with his own hand. Do you know he had to have other men be his hands? That's why God said, don't ask me anymore. Lest you be exalted above measure. I'm doing this to keep you humble. So if God tells me, Eric, don't ask me anymore. If this is for your, for your good, I say, praise the Lord. But do you want to know something? He hasn't told me that yet. Right. 
And you better make sure that you've heard the word of the living God before you let go. Jacob was wrestling with Christ. And Christ told him, the day is coming. Let go of me. Stop bothering me. Jesus wasn't having a problem wrestling with Jacob, with a mere man. He was pushing him to see if he would press his case to the throne of grace. He said, let go of me. Stop asking. You know what Jacob said? I won't let go of you because you swore to me. Jason, if you can, roll that next slide. The next stanza of that, of that verse. Let me see if this is it. Okay. Born of or by the Spirit. Born by the Spirit. What is the Spirit? Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Born by the Spirit with life from above. Justified fully. Tell me what the difference is between justification and sanctification. There's no difference. You look up the word justified in the Greek in the New Testament. You know what it means? It means to be declared righteous holy and just. Just. You've got two things that don't line up. Like when I was in architecture, we had to study and you had to justify a drawing. You had to make the plans, overlay one plan on top of the other and make sure the edges are all in the same places. Make sure that each point and each line is the same on the pattern as well as on the substance justified fully. You read how many times in the New Testament the Bible says we have been justified by faith in Christ Jesus, in Him. And the transaction so quickly was made. How many times have you heard about somebody that They got freedom and deliverance from cigarettes, and it happened in one moment of time. How many times have you read about somebody or heard about somebody that took them six months? What's the difference? What's the difference between one moment and six months? Is it because God didn't want to deliver this person from their habit? No, it's because of the lack of faith. And the Lord doesn't give up on us because we have no faith. That's why we have the faith of Jesus. His faith. So he says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Open God's word. Read it out loud. Because faith cometh by hearing. Speak his word. This last week, I got up one morning. And I'm not going to give any glory to the enemy. But we are fighting a fight of faith. And I was battling. I was battling. There was clouds over top of my head. I I felt like God had forsaken me. Have you ever read that in early writings? Is that going to happen to God's people? Has God forsaken us because we feel forsaken? Did Jesus feel forsaken? Did he give in to his feelings? I want you to listen to this. You cannot repulse the enemy by relating your fearful doubts, by telling him that you are horrified by the thought that you are lost. All of this is music to his ears. He wants to make you as miserable as he is himself. But you can answer him by proclaiming the promise that you believe in the Son and therefore you shall not perish. You shall not perish. Thank, take the word of Jesus Christ as more sure and valuable than any word that can come from a human agent. Has he said it? Do you know what my wife cried out? People would say, your husband's committing adultery. It's been four and a half years. You know what she would say? Thus saith the Lord. What I have joined together, let no man put asunder. Let no man put asunder. Let no man put asunder. The doctor says, Eric, you're a diabetic. I say, don't you say that. That's a lie. 
God's Word says I'm a child of the Most High. God's Word said that I am healed. God's Word says that I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. God's Word says that greater is He that is in us than he that is in this world. So who do I believe? Do I believe something that's written on a piece of paper? Do I believe the words out of some man's mouth? Or do I believe the Word of the living God? I want you to hear something. This was out of an article in Signs of the Times. And if you're interested in the documentation, send me an email and I'll send you all the verses, everything. Listen to this. What was the purpose of Christ in coming to this world? The mission of Christ to the world was to break the chains of Satan from the soul and to set at liberty those that are bound. He had one purpose. He had one purpose purpose to set at liberty. I don't want you all telling me what you're bound to, or if you're not bound, I don't want you to tell me the struggles. But I want you to think in your own mind, what is it that you're struggling with? Is it doubt? Is it appetite? Is it lust? Is it anger? Is it bitterness? Is it rejection? I want you to ask yourself right now, make a list, write it down, take it to the Lord like Hezekiah did. Write it down and say, Lord, this is what's wrong. This is what I'm battling with. You promised you would set me free. I claim that promise in Christ Jesus. And 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, All the promises of God in Him are what? They are yea and they are amen. Do you know what that means? They are begun and they are completed in Him because He is the author and He's the finisher of of your faith. Listen to what she says, what this author says. He healed the sick. He comforted the desponding. He brought hope to the despairing and preached the gospel to the poor. What is the word gospel? All right, what does that mean? Tell me. Who said good news? All right. Young lady, tell me what good news is to you. Today, how old are you? 13, 14, 15? What, is good, what would be good news in your life this week? Is, does Jesus care about that? Yes. You better believe He does. The word gospel means glad tidings. And I want you to see this. Anytime you see this in the New Testament, you'll see the word preach, preach, What do you think when you see the word preach? That's somebody else that does that, right? I'm not a preacher. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor. When I see that word preach, I think immediately you think that's somebody else. That's that that man that's at church every week. The word preach, do you know what it means in Greek? It means proclaim. Why did Jesus tell those, those two demoniacs don't, I don't want you following me. I don't want you to be an evangelist. I want you to go home and I want you to proclaim what great things God hath done for you. Those who were listening to Jesus' teachings did not need to consult a dictionary to find out His meaning. Have you ever thought about that? His words were so simple that a child could grasp His meaning. He did not take a text and then give a discourse on science, though he could have opened the mysteries of science to the world. He did not preach from a newspaper. He did not preach from a newspaper. His, pro- his, his purpose in being here was not political. He could have preached about the injustices of Rome. He could have preached about what's wrong with abortion and what's wrong with... He came to set the captives free. He did not preach from a newspaper, but he bent his energies toward one object, only one, the salvation of the lost. What does the word salvation mean? I need you all to help me. What does the word salvation mean? What does the word saved mean? Okay, there's one. I need some help. Other people? 
Okay, rescued. Rescued. Delivered. Let me give you another one. This is not from Webster's. This is from Strong's Concordance. Greek and Hebrew. Rescued, delivered, set free, healed, and made whole. When at the cross my Savior made me whole. That's the Greek and the Hebrew word. What are you going to do with that? Do we need salvation in our churches? I need it. You know what Jesus is saying? Then why don't you take it? I've already made the lunch for you. Why do you keep asking me for lunch? Why, are you, why do you keep asking me for something that I've already done? When Jesus came to the man that was at the pool of Bethesda, do you remember his words? What did he say to that man? Do you want to be made whole? And you know what the man did? He uttered the words that Satan was whispering in his ear. I can't. Every time I try. How many times have you tried to overcome whatever it is you're battling? Do you understand? Every time I try, I fail. Do you know what the scripture says? Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Look unto me and be ye saved. Be ye saved. Rescued. Delivered. Set free. Healed. Made whole. Do you know what the servant of the Lord said? She said, if you want an example of this, she said, look at when the children of Israel were bitten by the serpents in the wilderness. Did they deserve to be bitten? Yes. God didn't send the snakes to get them. The snakes were already there. God just pulled back his protection so that the children of Israel would be humbled and realized how dependent they were on him. He removed his hand so that they would realize, Daddy, I still need you. Don't let go of my hand. And do you know what the servant of the Lord said? She said, the sick, the dead, and the dying were everywhere. And many of them were moaning and groaning. And a messenger, a message came running through the camp. Remember, there was over a million and a half people there. Moses couldn't stand up and say something and everybody hear him. A messenger had to go and carry the word. That's us. A messenger came to the camp and said, there's been a solution. The Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahuwah. He told everyone, if you'll look at this symbol of the serpent that Moses is lifting upon a cross, if you'll look, you'll live. And do you know what she said? She said, everyone that looked was healed instantly. Amen. Do you know that the Bible says that? They didn't have to go through rehabilitation. Um, Christ did not bring up to them all their past failures. He didn't tell them, um, you're struggling with anger. I'll tell you what, if you'll stop eating pork, I'll forgive you and deliver you from the anger. Amen. You find one place in the Bible where Jesus told somebody, go get your life straightened out and then I'll heal you. I found a place where he forgave somebody and delivered them, a woman that was thrown at his feet. And you know what he told her? Go and sin no more. That wasn't a command. It was a promise. He was like, you're free. Go. Sin no more. Turn with me to John chapter 3. Turn with me to John chapter 3. This is a familiar story to all of us. Listen to this and put your name in there. Picture this. This is you that's there. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. What that means is he was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was not like you all, and I think, you know, in our day, it was just this religious group, uh, a sect. They were the ones that made the rules for the entire nation. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, 
they all had to obey whoever was a member of the Sanhedrin. They set the rules. This man was a ruler in Israel. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he wasn't one of those ones that was committing adultery. This man, as far as human works are concerned, he was righteous. He crossed his T's and dotted his I's. By the letter of the law, he was perfect. The same man came to Jesus, Yeshua, by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. He knew this man is from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest. What's the last thing say? Except what? I need y'all to say it. I need to hear you. Except God be with him, no man can do what you're doing. Except God be with him. You read on down through here and Jesus starts talking about, you know, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus, in verse 9, he answers Jesus. He says, how can these things be? How? Have you ever asked yourself that? I can, I can come to church. I can, I can eat right. I can dress right. I can, I can do the right things, the letter of the law. And that sometimes it's hard, but I can grit my teeth and I can do it. If we're going to get to heaven by gritting our teeth, we're there by willpower. And in John chapter 1, the Lord says that won't happen. Not by blood, nor the will of man, nor the will of flesh, but by the will of God. Nicodemus said, how can I be born again? When I've read this in the past, it's almost like we belittle Nicodemus. He was not stupid. This man knew the scriptures inside and out. Do you know that to be a Pharisee and to be of the class that Nicodemus was and like Paul was, they say you had to have memorized the first five books of the Bible? That's Jewish history. Memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This man knew the scriptures. And he's asking Jesus, how is this possible? Listen to what Jesus answered him. Art thou a master of Israel and yet knowest not these things? Jesus wasn't mocking him. Jesus was saying the same thing to him that he's saying to you and I today. The same thing that he's saying to his church, his people, in every denomination across the world. He's saying the same thing today. Are you a master? Are you a Christian? And yet you don't understand these things? This is the whole purpose of the gospel. This is the whole purpose of the glad tidings. Is that we might know how to be begotten again. It's not about changing which day you go to church. It's not about... Those things are good. It's not about, you know, eating this and not eating this and doing this and doing that. Those things are good. They're important to the Lord, but that won't get you to heaven. You're still a leopard or you're still an Ethiopian and you can't change your spots. You can't change the color of your skin. You can't change that you were born a sinner. Amen. That's not my word. That's God's word in Romans. You were born under Adam. You can't change that. There's only one person that can. Jesus asked Nicodemus, are you a master in Israel and do you not understand this? So that means the answer to this problem of how we are born again, it has to be in the Old Testament. It has to be in the Old Testament. Because there was no New Testament when Jesus was speaking these words. There was a promise and I'm going to not turn to these. I want you just to listen. You can look them up or I'll give you the, the references. There was a promise made to Israel in Exodus chapter 25, verse 1 through 8. Do you know what the Lord said? He said, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. What does that mean to us today? 
let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. And then in verse 40 of Exodus 25, he reaffirms and he tells Moses something really important. He says, and make sure that you make it according to the pattern that I showed you in the mountain. Not in heaven, he says, in the mountain. What did Moses see in the mountain that he was supposed to make a sanctuary that was similar to? He saw the glory of God. He saw Christ Jesus. He saw Christ Jesus. Do you know that in Isaiah, the Lord tells us that Christ Jesus, I will make him to be a sanctuary for Israel. He told Moses, make a sanctuary, make a temple so that I can come and dwell among you. Do you know what the word among is? In the midst, in your heart. Make me a sanctuary. What does the New Testament say? Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the living God? Make me a sanctuary so that I can come and dwell in your midst, in your heart. Give yourself to me. I'm knocking at the door. If you will open the door, I will come into you and we will sup. We will eat together. What do you think he's going to feed us? Words. Words of life. Bread of life. Water of life. I'm going to give you some examples. I just want you to make a note of these if you want to. Daniel chapter 9 verse 19. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. In these verses in the Old Testament, all through Isaiah, Zechariah, Hosea, Zephaniah, he says, I will dwell in your midst. The word midst doesn't mean he wants to come here and get in this big crowd. It means the middle part. I will dwell in your midst. I want him to be in your all's midst, but I want him to be in my midst. I don't need to read the scripture and think that's over there. It's speaking to me. If I was the only person alive, this was written to you. He says, I want to dwell in your midst. Make me a sanctuary. My son reminds me all the time. This verse is etched in my mind because of my son's words. He tells me one of his favorite verses in the entire Bible is Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Who remembers it? Offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy unto God. That's a temple. That's the whole purpose for a temple. Solomon said that in the Old Testament. He's building this temple and he says, what's the purpose of this? It was huge. It was one of the wonders of the world. And he looks in front of all the millions of Israel when he's dedicating the temple and he says, what is all this work for, all this money? He said, except to offer sacrifice to thee. It was a shadow of us. In John chapter 3, Verse 2, Nicodemus said, No man can do these miracles except God be with him. Do you know that the New Testament, in the Gospels, in John, John chapter 14, John chapter 5, John chapter 6, do you know that Jesus says, The works that you see me do, it's not me doing them. It's not who doing them? I thought he was the Son of God. He says, It's not me doing them. It's the Father, which is a spirit... John 4, 24, who's in me that's doing those works? We need the Father dwelling in us through His Son. What is another name for His Son? The Word. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Do you know that He wants to make the Word flesh today? In us If the Father dwells in us as He did in Christ, and He promised He would do that in John 17 through 21, then His Word will be made flesh in our flesh. And it won't be us that glories. It'll be us like Christ that says, Not I, but Him. 
Jesus answered Nicodemus. He knew what Nicodemus was asking. He wasn't changing subjects. He said, unless God is with you, no one can do what you're doing. Jesus answered him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see the reign, the sovereign reign of God. So how do we see this? We're there with Nicodemus and we're saying, okay, Lord, how does this happen? Turn back a few chapters to John chapter 1. Remember, Jesus is the word. John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. How did Jesus make the world? He spoke. Give me a reference. Where's that at in the scriptures? Psalm 33, 6 through 9 and Genesis 1. Psalm 33, 6 and 9, that's my favorite. Do you know what it says? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath and the spirit of his mouth. For he spake, and it was. He commanded, and it still stands fast. Do you know in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, he said, let the earth bring forth green grass. And what, did, what happened? It did. Do you know that he spoke that 6,000 years ago? It still is obeying him. Every year the green grass still comes up. They'll put pavement over top of it and it'll come right up through the pavement. You'll be downtown New York or Chicago or L.A. or Miami and here's concrete for miles, not any grass in sight. And here's a tree and you'll look and the, the pavement is just cracked and torn apart. Do you know that Hebrews chapter 4 says that? The Word of God is living and full of power, as Brother Roberto said. It is full of power and it is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we think or ask. All He wants you to do is take hold of that promise. Find one promise and don't say, oh, you're taking that out of context. Read the Scripture. Read the New Testament and find how many promises they took out of context. Read Sister White's writings and find how many verses you can find she took out of context. It's all over the place. Do you know why? Because in Isaiah chapter 28, my grandfather showed me something years ago. There's a promise there. He said, my word will be unto them line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little and there a little. And he said, but unfortunately, I have to do it that way so that they that don't believe will stumble and fall. He said, you take those verses and you put them together. You take promise after promise after promise. And then the devil will say, yeah, but. Do you know one time I had fallen. It was willful. I mean, I knew what I was doing. My flesh got the best of me and I fell. And I went to the Lord and I sought Him for weeks for forgiveness. For weeks, what does his word say? If I confess it to him, he's faithful and he's just in doing it. For weeks I battled and fasted and prayed. And do you know what? He spoke to me through his word. I read promise after promise. I didn't read Daniel and Revelation. I didn't read about the sanctuary. I read promises that he would forgive me. I read promises that he still loved me, even though I was dead in my sins. If you need physical help, don't read the things that aren't about that so much as the things that are about that. Read the promises that you need. Eat for what you need. So I was there and I came to the Lord. I knew I was forgiven. And I was like, Lord, I need your Holy Spirit. And I started begging again. And the Lord was like, why do you think I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit any different than I gave you the forgiveness? When were we forgiven? Roberto, when, we, when were we forgiven? Does the Bible say that? It does. Psalms 38. Turn with me. Isaiah 38. Turn with me there real quick. Isaiah chapter 38. Listen to what he says. Isaiah 38, 
verse 15. Read these with me. Look at this. What shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me and himself hath done it. Do you remember Exodus? All that the Lord hath said, we will do. That didn't work. Listen to what Isaiah says. He hath spoken unto me and himself hath done it. I shall go softly. That means humbly. I will go in humility all my years in the bitterness of my soul. That means recognizing that I'm nothing. I can do nothing without Him. Then look what He says. O Lord, by these, Thy words, by these, Thy words, men live. And in all these, Thy words is the life of my spirit. So wilt Thou recover me and make me to live. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but Thou hast in love for my soul, delivered me from the pit of corruption. He says, thou hast. Is that future tense? Past tense. Thou hast delivered me from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Amen. It's past tense. Do you know why? Because the word of the Lord is living and it abides forever. The moment he spoke it, it was done. Do you know when he spoke it? Do you know when he spoke it? Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. Zechariah 6, verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, that's unto us, Speak unto you, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, Jehovah, saying, Behold the man. Behold the man. Do you remember when Pilate said that? Why do you think Pilate said that? Because in the Old Testament it said that. He was fulfilling the word of God. He said, Behold the man whose name is the branch. And he shall grow up out of his place. And he shall build the temple of the Lord. We are the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. And he shall bear the glory. Who could go into the most holy place? Only the high priest. How often could he go in there? One day out of the year. And do you know that the high priest was terrified when he went in there? Why? Because the glory of the Lord was in there. The glory of the Lord was in there. If you had any unconfessed sin and you walked in there, you were slain instantly. Can you imagine how terrifying? Can you imagine what that high priest was doing for weeks prior to Day of Atonement? Now look at what it says. It says, He shall bear the glory. Christ has ascended on high. He is the one that bears the glory. When the Father looks at us, He looks through His Son. And He shall sit and rule upon His throne. You look up the text. I challenge you. Look up the text in the New Testament that say that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Look and see what it says when Stephen was about to be stoned. It says, Behold, I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of the Father. Do you know why He was standing? Because He got up. He was seated, the Bible says, waiting until His enemies are made His footstool, and He sees His servant Stephen about to be stoned, and Jesus got up. He got up. Do you know the Old Testament says that? Arise, O Lord, and scatter thine enemies. He shall sit upon His throne and He shall be a priest upon His throne. That's not allowed. You can't be a priest and a king unless you're Jesus Christ. There's only one example of that ever happening in all of Scripture, Melchizedek. That's why the Pope is Antichrist because he claims to be king of heaven and earth. He claims to sit upon a throne and be a priest. He shall sit upon His throne and He shall be a priest upon His throne. And look at this last statement. And the council of peace 
shall be between them both. Between the Father and the Son. The Father said, I make you a promise. If you will do this, I'll forgive every sin. Every sin. Every iniquity and every transgression. Jesus said, I'll take all their sins, all their iniquities, and all their transgressions, and I will become guilty for them. The Father says, I'll forgive it. Ephesians chapter 1. You don't have to turn there, but look there, because that's where the promise is, is proclaimed that it's been fulfilled. John chapter 1. Back to John chapter 1. I'm going to hurry now. It says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Verse 11. Now look at verse 12. But as many as received Him. What's His name? Jesus. Yeshua. The Word of God. Do you know what Yeshua means? What Hebrew for Jesus means? Jehovah saves. Yahweh salvate. Do you believe Jesus' name? They that believe on my name, I believe that Jesus saves today. But as many as received him, that grabbed hold of the borders of his garment, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That word sons means begotten children. Even to them which believe on his name, which were born or begotten not of blood, nor of the will of your flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. The Lord tells us in John 17, verse 17, He's praying to His Father, and He says, Father, sanctify them through Thy truth. What's the rest of it? Thy word is truth. I want you to look at this. Thy word is, is truth. What is truth? It's a big question. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I want you to remember this. The word truth means verity. It means verity. 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 Thy word is verity. Do you know what that means? It can't change. Thy word is verity. Do you want to be born again? Do you want to have victory over sin? Then find the promise. I ask the Lord sometimes. Sometimes I lose my temper with my children or I'm ugly to my wife. And I think, and I, I go back and I apologize. And I go back in the room and I'm like, I get on my, on my knees and I say, Father, I don't want this. Amen. And I'll battle there for a little while. And he'll say, Eric, you're battling in the wrong place. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Go to the Word. They overcame Him by the Word of their testimony, by the blood of the Lamb and by the Word of their testimony. Go to the Word. I want to read something to you quickly, and I want you to listen to this. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized? Right after this, or right before this here in John. I don't remember the exact order that it lists there. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized? Why was he baptized? For those who couldn't be baptized. So you're saying that his baptism counts for somebody. Maybe they're, they're crippled. They can't get to water. Maybe there's no water. Does his baptism count for theirs? So you're saying everything that happened at his baptism is mine. Right? Everything that happened in Christ's life is mine. This is the reason he shall be called the Lord my righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. I want you to listen to this. 
After Jesus had been baptized by John in the Jordan, he went straightway up out of the water to the bank of the river and he bowed in the attitude of prayer. One gospel lists that. He bowed. He bowed to pray. Why, why was he praying after his baptism? Listen. In his prayer, Christ with his human arm encircled fallen humanity while with his divine arm he reached for the throne of the infinite. His hands were raised upward and his eyes were fixed as if penetrating heaven and he poured out his soul in supplication to his father for strength to meet the unbelief and sinfulness of men, to break the power of Satan over man and to be able, be able to overcome Satan on behalf of man. He asked the Father. It says, Never had angels listened to such a prayer. They were ready and willing. They were eager to bear to the praying Redeemer the message of assurance and love. Can you imagine all the angels of heaven? And they're watching the commander of the armies of heaven. And he just was baptized like a man. And now he's asking his Father... Father, will you accept me on all their behalf? And the angels are saying, Gabriel is saying, send me. I, can tell, I, I want to go. I want to go down there to tell him. They can't wait to tell him because they see how the father feels about his son. Never had angels listened to such a prayer. But no, the father himself will minister to his son. Direct from the throne, proceeding from the light of the glory of God, the heavens were opened and beams of light and glory proceeded there from and assumed the form of a dove, light and glory. The people stood spellbound with fear and amazement. Their eyes were fastened upon Christ, who, whose bowed form was bathed in the beautiful light and glory that ever surrounds the throne of God. His upturned face was glorified as they had never before seen the face of a man. The thunders rolled and the lightnings flashed from the opening heavens. And a voice came therefrom in terrible majesty saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The light which fell from the open portals upon the head of our Savior will fall upon us as we pray for help to resist temptation. The voice which spoke to Jesus speaks to every believing soul. This is my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. Amen. That's her quote. That's the words of Scripture. If He is my substitute and He is my sacrifice and He is my surety, every word that the Father spoke to Him, He was speaking to you and I. So how are we born again? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. And this was so beautiful because our brother this morning actually read you read probably 10 of the verses that I had written down here. Hebrews chapter 1. Look at what it says. And God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto our fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son who being the brightness of His glory, verse 3, and the express image of His person, and holding up all things by the word of His power, when He had, past tense, when He had by Himself purged our sins, He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. How do you get your last name? It's only inherited. You can't get a last name without inheritance. 
Look at verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he, the Father, at any time, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten Thee. Do you know that Jesus is saying that today? Do you want to be born again today? He's saying that today. You are my son. This day have I begotten thee. The Bible says we are begotten again by the word of truth. James 1.18 We are begotten by the word of truth. James 1.18 For of his own will begat he us with the word of truth or by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 Praise God the Father of, of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten you again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. 1 Peter chapter two, 1, verse 22. Seeing that ye have obeyed your souls, purified your souls, I'm sorry. Seeing that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. In Hebrews chapter 3, the Lord tells us something. Most important chapter, if you can read this this week, Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4, He says, Today, if you will hear My voice, harden not your heart. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 says, Today is the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. Isaiah 49 verse 8 says, Today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. If we will only hear His voice. You claim a promise. You find a promise. And then you find as many as you can. And you write them out. Write them out. And you begin to speak His promises. Amen. Speak His promises. For with the heart we believe unto righteousness. But with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. His word cannot fail. I'm going to tell you one quick story. We were at Sabbath school and we were talking about the promises of God one week. And somebody there who loves the Lord with all of their heart was struggling with a lost child with a child that had walked away from the Lord, who, who had, had given in to the voice of, of the enemy, of the liar. And we were talking about God's promises, and one of the people brought up a response, uh, something to help this person that was struggling with their lost child. They said, the Lord says, if you'll raise them up in the way they should go, when they get old, they will not depart from it. And then somebody else in the congregation said, yeah, but... And I know they didn't mean this, but they said, yeah, but we've all got free will. Ask yourself a question. What do you think that just did to the faith and the promise of God? God's promise said, if I raise them up, they won't depart. Either Jesus meant that or he didn't mean that. Is God's will stronger than my will? Yes. He just said we're not born again by the will of man or the will of flesh. We're born again by the will of God. So I'm in that position. I think, okay, I'm here and I hear this person and all of a sudden they've got, God's word says he'll save them. But this other word says, yeah, but, yeah, but they've got free will. And I went home that day and I was really troubled about that. I said, Lord, your word can't fail. It says nothing can be put to it. Nothing can be taken from it. He's not a liar. He doesn't change his mind. His word won't return unto him void. I said, Lord, I need, I need an answer. How do we answer this? How do I answer this? And the Lord told me, he said, I do, they do have free will, but I can win their will. My will is greater than their will. So what that means is, is that if my wife, who is a beautiful, loving, kind, godly woman, 
if I wanted to marry her and we weren't married yet and she's just not interested in me for whatever reason and I keep pursuing and she's still not interested. She said, Eric, I mean, I know you're a good Christian. I like you as a friend, but there's, there's no, I have no feelings for you like that. We can't get married. What do I do? Do I just go home? What does Jesus do when we tell him that? He pursues us. Do you know the scripture says that? That's right. He wins our hearts. By love, he showers us with love and with blessings. So she says, I'm not interested. And I say, you will be. Maybe not to her, but I do on my own. I say, you will be. I'm going to win her heart. And you know, you, you know people like that everywhere. You think, how in the world did that guy get that girl? Or how did that girl get that man? They won their heart. That's what God does. Amen. And God doesn't do it by holding up a set of rules and say, you fix these first and then I'll come and help you. God says, let me show you how much I love you. Would you like me to heal you of that disease? And because I healed you of that disease, now you want to live the way that I want you to live. Amen. Do you understand? He can win our will. I pray that the Lord will bless us and that we'll take His word literally, no matter what is whispered in our ear by the devil or even our own thoughts. God's word is greater. God's word is greater. If you would, bow with me. Father in heaven, Father, we thank you so much for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of thee in him. Father, we thank you for your love. Father, thank you for chasing us. Father, you are like that father that was waiting on the prodigal son. And every day, I know that father was sending out his servants to find out what had happened to his son. Every day he longed and looked at the horizon for the day when his son would come home. Father, your word says it is thy goodness which leads us to repentance. Father, we can't even want to do what's right if it wasn't for you putting that in our heart. Father, help us today to accept what you have freely done for us. Help us to take hold of your word to accept the victory, to rise and to shake off the chains that shackle us and bind us to sin and doubt and fear. Help us to believe your word and as Enoch did, to walk in your word. We ask you, Father, and we thank you for your word shall not return unto you void. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.